Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you guys are having a great time today, um, learning all about the AI water. Um, we have uh, so far great presentations on what's happening in pharma industry and healthcare industry uh, with respect to AI. Um, we thought that it's, uh, you know we should also talk about what the future of AI looks like in healthcare and pharma. Um, so today I have a great lineup of uh, panelists. Um, I'll start with Bill. Uh, Bill currently leads um, health, healthcare and life sciences at Samba Nova Systems, um, and I'll let him introduce himself. Yeah, really great to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Uh, like Sahab said, I lead healthcare and life sciences at Samba Nova. We are a uh, next-gen AI and machine learning solution company, we've really developed um, the first of its kind solution specifically designed for AI workloads. Uh, we could talk a little about more about that during the presentation, but uh, very happy to be here today and have this discussion. Next, I have uh, Shamir uh, Qadir. Uh, he leads uh, data science and artificial intelligence. He's senior director at AstraZeneca. Uh, Shamir, do you want to introduce this all? Thank you, Sahab, and, and thanks, Rework, for having me here in this uh, great panel discussion today. Uh, I'm with AstraZeneca for almost three years now. I lead a global data science team. I head the special projects and research group within the data science and AI, where we focus on uh, sort of high value, high impact, and high risk problems, and, and we try to use uh, machine intelligence to solve them. Thank you. And we have uh, Shubha Chaudhary. Uh, she is the head of digital transformation at Noma, uh, Noma Nordisk. Nordisk. Sorry, Sorry. getting a tongue twister there. Um, no, uh, Shubha, do you want to introduce, please introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Ab. Um I'm head of digital transformation at Novartis. I know it can get confusing, but Novartis is the third largest, or for that matter, second largest pharmaceutical in the world. Um, and my experience has largely been in R&D, uh, driving digital transformation along. Thank you, glad to be here. Great. So my first question is for uh, Shamir. So Shamir, you mentioned you worked uh, in, um, uh, at, you know, in clinical, uh, clinical research uh, and you utilize AI in clinical research. What are the uh, recent advancement of AI in drug discovery and clinical trials um, in our DA space and pharma? And sure, what are yeah. the outcomes of that? Yeah, so it's a, you know, in a way, you know, I'm in this space for more than 15 years, been an applied uh, data scientist. We, we don't used to call data scientists back then. They say the bioinformatics scientists or quantitative scientists back in the day. So uh, interestingly, the problems uh, uh, more or less remains the same. Like, you know, if you go to drug discovery, we want to identify or define our disease population better. We want to identify new drug target. We want to do patient subtyping better. We, we want to do drug repositioning in a more accelerated way. These were some of the problems we've been keep talking 14 or 15 years ago uh, in, in, in this space. But what we did not have back then was a lot of data. And then also, in a way, we have a recent AI spring. We have much matured methods that can take in all data, can do you know, not just a rigorous analytics on top of that, that, that analytics are valid enough that we can take them through the end air clinical development process. So though, though some of these are like really recent developments, but the problems remain the same. So I would say if you take a disease definition, what, what is a disease? How do you define type two diabetes patient population? So you ask 10 doctors, you'll get, you know, maybe around six to seven different answers, but we can now def get all of that opinion, define a machine learning model and computationally define what could be, what should be a type two diabetes patient. So we have made a lot of progress in that, especially in the phenotyping space. And you come to target discovery, like, you know, uh, we, we have diseases like, you know, um, uh, for example, Huntington disease or any other classical monogenic disease, we know the target. We are not able to develop a therapy against them. So, and then for, whereas on the other side, we have other diseases, whether it's NASH or others, we are still looking for newer targets. So this problem is again, uh, still relevant. But now what we have better approach, like you can generate multi-scale, multi-omic data set, like you can measure different biological aspects, different clinical aspects from your patient. 
and then not just analyze them separately. You can put them together and get inference from that. This was not possible, let's say, five or 10 years ago. And then you can add on to that. You can bring in imaging data. You can bring in real-world data, how patients are, take, whether they're taking their medicine or they're switching their medicine. You can bring all of that data. You can subtype your patient population and then target them specifically with your treatment. And then, and then other area that we see that takes a lot of traction these days, especially in a post-COVID world, is drug repositioning. We have seen that there are a lot of drug discovery projects happening for, for COVID. One of the successful cases is dexamethasone, which is an already existing drug, which is a golden example of what repositioning can do. And then, but now you can do repositioning in an accelerated way, in a, in a, in a more, uh, what you call, in a systematic way using a machine learning approach. So you know, these are all coming together. So I would say in drug discovery, there are a wide array of, pro the problems are pretty much classic, but the solutions are brand new and they're powered by new data and new algorithms. So that's how I see drug discovery part. And when you come to clinical trials, again, things are changing because we did not have access to, you know, data like the way we have now, right? Like, you know, because, you know, in terms of if you want to improve patient engagement, which is one of the critical problem in clinical trial, like because within a large, you know, large clinical trial, you enroll tens of thousands of patients, and then are they, you know, feeling uh, safe, secure, and are they going to continue? We don't have any information about any of this. And then also there are like different strata of data. You know, if you have a trial. A trial will happen in a country. Within a country, you have sites, and then site you have, you know, you you have your patient and your provider a lot of layers of data that could come into your systems. But what we can do is that we can collect some of this data and then build what you call, um, you know, in a way, predictive models to improve your patient engagement so that you can predict who is more likely to, you know, enroll in a trial, what, what about the dropout rate, and then use that information to make sure that, you know, uh, you can improve the engagement rate all throughout your clinical trial. So that's one part that, you know, more data-driven way you can do. And then on the other hand, we have also seen from, you know, thanks to advances in biomedical engineering, now you have wearables and sensors, which are much cheaper and affordable that you can deploy in a trial. So you don't even have patients to come to the hospital. We can go to the patient in a, in a more decentralized or digital way. So that's also coming along like with, with the wearable tech and IoT and remote monitoring. The patients can be there can be there where they are safe, like, like especially in the setting of COVID. And then, but then we can collect data in a more, uh, you know, uh, in, a remote, in, a, in a remote way, but at the same time that, that will keep the patient within the trial. So all of these are coming along, but then again, we have never measured this, this type of data because we don't know what's the, what's the in terms of uh, clinical standards for some of the variables that we are measuring. So we need to do, we still have a long way to go, but then, you know, we are in that, that phase where we are much more capable than, you know, back in 2019. And we are seeing a lot more data coming into the trial that would ultimately improve, uh, from a clinical trial perspective, improve patient engagement. That sounds uh, a really amazing things, uh, especially for patients, right? This is definitely improving, um, getting um, the healthcare, the drugs and therapies uh, to these patients as early as, as possible. We're AI is really speeding up. Um, Bill, do you have, uh, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think a couple of things that Shamir said really resonate. One is clearly what scientists are finding is, you know, more data is better. Uh, so not only more different kinds of data like IoT data and RWE data that sort of, sort of coming into these, these formulations and, you know, drug discovery as well as clinical trials, but also just more of it and letting the data sort of lead uh, in that discovery, um, sort of understanding what these kinds of data bring to the table. And, and what's been interesting for, for us from my perspective as, as thinking about how are we going to enable large pharmas to really utilize all that data and feed it into AI and feed it into ML, and there's some counterintuitive things that are happening. So for instance, you know, uh, one of the things I talked about is you know, at AstraZeneca, they're using recommendation models in drug discovery. So they're using a knowledge graph and then using recommendation models on top of that. So you think of recommendation models as how Netflix and Amazon tell us what to buy and what movies to watch and things like that. You can use that also in a more sophisticated way to try to find targets within a really complex knowledge graph 
with all the data that Shamir is referring to. So I think as we get deeper into both this massive growth in data and this, the, the patient sort of centricity, but also starting to think about how these different kinds of AI can be used to really accelerate how we go through this traditionally multi-year and multi-billion dollar process. So I'm glad you guys brought the uh, the importance of data here, right? This it all starts with data, and uh, Shiva leads the digital transformation, and we know there's a lot of work that's been done in digital transformation when it comes to clinical and R&D space, and I would love to know what her thoughts on that. So I think I think uh, Shamir and Bill touched upon it, right? Um, I feel um, my observation is today biology is producing um, data at unimaginable scales that we didn't see before, and I actually think that the data uh, uh, ability to formulate data in the right way, integrate it, um, as well as ability to understand it. Is not has not kept par with the with the ability of biology to produce those data sets, and 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 the reason is the complexity of the data sets. I, I think Shamir, uh, from his background as well as um, uh, yourself, Saad, as well as Bill, all of us understand, and and everybody else now, COVID has made it even more interesting for the masses to understand the complexity of the data sets. Um, part of the reason why I feel the industry hasn't done its due diligence to move forward in the digital space. Having said that, I think if there was any positive influx of COVID is basically just stimulating that engine. And I think there is a youth, we are entering a unique phase for life sciences as well as healthcare to turn around on this digital transformation and, and lead the way. And I, I think this is happening as we speak, right? But data stays at the forefront. Um, and, and that's where most of the work um, is needed um, in order to get the right insights as well, right, and the analytics as well. Sometimes we also see analytics driving data, but at the end of the day, it's just still the data that needs to get work done, right? Shamir and others could argue if they were biostatisticians on this call, they would say, we've been, we are the data scientists, we have been the data scientists, and they are. Really, they have been the data scientists who kind of talk about how should the drug work, how should the drug create be created from discovery all the all the way through the pharma life chain. But the computing power is what has made it easy, and I think the next step now is the data, cleaning up the data, making the data sets easily accessible, and so on. A great example is to look at um, COVID, right? We have, we have shortened the clinical trial phase. We've done all kinds of things across the stakeholder community as well. So that's that's how I look at digital transformation um, altogether. And that's like COVID is definitely a great example. So it's amazing how much we have accomplished in last year as things that used to take years, we did in one year. So um, yeah, that's totally resonate with everybody. Um, I have a question for uh, Shiva. Um, what are the barriers and roadblocks um, that are currently in place that prevents advancement of using AI in R&D? Um, so the traditional ones, right? The traditional ones that I think all of us can agree here has been regulatory, right? You hear that one coming up and over and over again. But I think, I personally think that's going lower on the chain. And I think, I think now it is life sciences and healthcare having an ability to actually transform their end-to-end -end processes instead of doing the incremental changes with AI. That's a mindset issue, right? Um, if people start, I, I uh, in my talks, I very, many a times I talk about looking at the R&D value chain as an algorithm. How can you look at the entire R&D uh, value chain as an algorithm and how can you drive that transformation? So it's a mindset. Uh, issue there. And then uh, as you start looking at the advanced analytics, analytic, analytical ability, again, I think many of us here and the audience will agree to this. If we continue to have it as a black box operation, this is not going to take us anywhere. I think applying advanced anal uh, analytics and be able to show, open up that block, 
black box and show how to, how did we, right? How did we validate the understand the underlying presumptions of the algorithms itself? That has been an hindrance, hindrance which has led to um, a bit of skepticism in the in the community as well as some that are getting convinced, right? But the more and more it opens up, the more and more um, it will become further away from being a barrier. And then I think um, we talked about data. And so the data privacy aspects are very much core and central, right? Um, I mean, how do you keep the trust with the end patient? How do you try to keep the trust with your stakeholders that are in that community? Um, these are some of the barriers that I feel uh, need to be overcome. I'm, I'm now less worried about the regulatory uh, part because you've seen in COVID, they've come through. Actually, many other partnerships that we've seen um, have actually been with, um, with regulatory being part of it, right? Operation Warp Speed has been a great example of seeing that the regulatory folks have an open mind to this. But I think it's going to be time for life sciences and healthcare, um, who still I feel is behind, uh, to have open mindsets and, and let it disrupt its, uh, it, 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 your, the processes itself. No, you're totally spot on right. It's, it's the mindset, right? And it's, it's been, we have done things um, in many, many, for, for many years, and it will, the whole regulatory space is very hard to bring changes with, within, within the framework. Um, and Bill gave an example of Netflix uh, using a recommendation system. And I can, I, I mean, I, I would take this to Shamir and trying to explain how that translates it because, because you can't really take that because Netflix that may not have those kind of risks as we have in healthcare. And we have to be very careful how we use those machine learning algorithms and the whole explainable AI piece. Um, yeah, sure. I think, you know, uh, Subhat, uh, Subhat touched a very important point, right? Like you know, engaging with that you know, stakeholders in the entire value chain is critically important. But if you ask me, what is that biggest roadblock? I would say it's all about change management. Right, like who's your user going to be? Is that user going to take your algorithm? Is he going to take an action using that algorithm? Because we have to understand that in the end, it's all about maths. This is, you know, we are not, we're doing a bit of a little bit, you know, intermediate to advanced level maths behind these models, right, in the end. But then there are certain factors around that. Every model, you know, there is a certain error rate. And the model, you know, there are there is a variability associated with your model. So let's say, I can tell you uh, a few, and then there are uncertainty associated with your model. And then when you bring all of this, and then right now you have better algorithms to make you know al your your prediction in you know, a little bit more explainable. There is a whole uh, you know branch of AI research that's you know that's going under you know explainable AI. We have better methods. Even four or five years ago, we did not have. So now you can not only build models, you can explain that. But then let me ask, you know, let, the real challenge here is, is not the tech side. It's, it's about the it's usability side. It's user adoption side. I'll tell you one good example that I had to face in my career. So this was a, a healthcare analytics project. We wanted to build a project using almost a million patients. So it was statistically robust, you know, one of the largest data set you can get. It's differentially, pri you know, privacy applied and all of that. And the application was to predict disease trajectory. Like if you give me you know, a, a you know, a, a type two diabetes patients. Can I predict what his trajectory going to be in in three, six, or you know, twelve months or two years? Whether he would move to he would become a you know hypertensive patient, or he would become an autoimmune disease patient, or he would become another class of disease patient. So, so can you predict? So we built the system using these million uh, patient database, and then we had that you know uh, resource available. But is is you know who's going to use this? Is physician ready to use it? Maybe uh, the physician champion is ready to use, and a few smaller number of you know physicians are ready to use. But we cannot enforce that everybody should use this one to make uh, you know to 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 do patient care. That's not going to happen. Number one, and then other part is that let's say if if there is you know if every physician is using this, and I'm giving you this information in a in a physician patient encounter, I'm showing you a graph saying that. If you don't exercise or eat well, this is where you will end up in your trajectory. But if you do, this is where you will end up in your trajectory. We can, you know, there is a whole area of shared decision making that we can do. 
But then what if patient is not ready to change the behavior? So, the, so that's a bit, so, so I would say if somebody asked me that it's really in that actionability and change management of your problem. It's more, you know, we can say that there is a, the data, the analytics, the technical aspects, but beyond that, it's about its usability. So, so that's, that's, that's uh, my take on this, this uh, uh, cha challenges that we could face. Bill, uh, do, you, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I mean, I think I, I think really explainability is a great thing to think about. And I saw a very cool thing last week um, where a AI algorithm for imaging actually gives a pixel by pixel explanation of what the AI was quote unquote thinking when it made the diagnosis from this image. Uh, and, and, you know, the other challenges are the classic sort of healthcare challenges. It's not like any other business. If Netflix tells me I watched Peaky Blinders, so I should watch Bridgerton, and that's a miss, no big deal. If it's a miss in healthcare, it's a totally different thing. So I think that focus on the quality and accuracy of what we're doing with AI is really important too. So I actually have yeah, a question for you, Bill. So as we are talking about all these things, uh, things that have been done, that we have been doing right now, uh, the barriers and roadblocks, what do you think, um, where should AI leaders and practitioners focus on impact uh, and in the near future? So uh, I, I really liked uh, Shuba's, you know, looking at it as an algorithm, and you can sort of think about it as the whole, one of the things that COVID did was sort of expose this sort of convergence of the healthcare and pharma ecosystem where you know, healthcare payers are gonna now be saying to pharma is, you know, show me with real world evidence why this new drug is better than the old one. And you know, the, the farmers are gonna be using SDOH and uh, healthcare economics data and medical affairs, et cetera, et cetera. So as you look at that whole algorithm, leaders I think should be focusing on where can we make impact in, in the outcomes across the ecosystem by using AI. So we, when we do this in healthcare, we really have to think about it a slightly different way. But if you look at drug discovery, for instance, I mean, everyone uses this seven year, $3 billion, some people say it's 10 to 15 years from idea to pharmacy. You know, if we can use both NLP to form knowledge graphs, I had the chief innovation officer at one of the largest farmers in the world say, if I only knew what we knew, the stuff that I could do, and, you know, that was the, the problem that I've been working with farmers on for the last decade or so, has been putting that data together, integrating it, understanding it. Now it's moving from that to having an NLP model that I can search through that data and organize it in the way that a scientist thinks. So how does this protein relate to this molecule, to this disease pathway? And then be able to use another model to look through and say, you know, maybe we should look at these 10 targets. So what I, how I think of it is there's sort of this industrial revolution going on where we're going from this very artisanal approach. We have these brilliant scientists and data scientists and chemists who are doing incredible things, finding these drugs, but the hard way, the slow, expensive, really hard, non-repeatable way. If we can actually start to use machine learning and AI to make some of these processes more uh, efficient and repeatable like they are now, then we can have the scientists iterating faster, using their skills for higher level stuff. So again, because it's healthcare, we have to be very careful. And I think there's gonna be a human in the loop in all of this for a very, very long time. But if we can take some of these processes and figure out where can they really have an impact, like in telehealth. So we, we, everyone says, you know, we went five years ahead in telehealth in six months because of COVID. But what we have now is V1, you know, virtual care and telehealth. Every aspect of that, doctor picking, symptom checking, virtual assistants, chatbots, all of that is powered by AI in the background, and it can all get much better. And the better it gets, the more the adoption by the patients will come in and then we'll really start affecting outcomes. So I think leaders really, they need to understand what the true state of the art is, what AI can really do now, 
um, and then sort of really be thinking about where it should be applied. And those are really all the conversations that I have is, yes, we have the next gen technology and it's fastest and the most accurate and all that, but what should the first project be? Where should we go first and, and you know, have those successes? Yep, no, well, those are great points. I think um, I'll ask Shiba um, to actually build on her, uh, pre you know, previous response because, um, you know, she brought really um, key uh, pain points uh, for AI adoption. Um, I, like, where would you advise um, the, you know, AI practitioner, pharma, you know, leaders and how we can actually get away from the things that, you know, that we have um, the obstacles we have right right now, and, and what what would advice would you give them? So I I actually agree with uh, Bill in in when he said that um, scalability is an important aspect of things, right? And if you uh, many of us probably know Absalera, who is now working closely with Lily and many other farmers. But these guys were able to, had an ability to repeat its success with the first antibody of COVID, right? They went through uh, churning, screening 5 million um, immune cells to find the antibodies that can interact. And they are, ability to, they are able to repeat this over and over again now, right? And that's an important element. So if, as long as um, the objective is not to focus on done once and closed out and only used once, right? The repeatable aspect of things is, uh, I think, an important element that everybody needs to focus on when it comes to data and analytics, um, and specifically in the healthcare and um, life sciences world. In the healthcare world, I, I feel um, outcomes which are, you know, generally, so Shamir mentions about diabetes and I'll talk about cardiovascular, right? A couple of years back, there was an incentive to say, well, how many patients end up, that a cardiovascular patient end up into emergency rooms, right? And all of us, or many of us would know, the indication swelling on your legs, sleepless nights, right? Your, um, your general um, energy levels and, and various such things, right, which can be captured some of this by the IoT devices now, right? So how do you actually disrupt this process in the healthcare space, which is directed then to the outcomes of patient management, disease management, and overall healthcare costs? I think this is where uh, so th there needs to be a bit of focus as well from a, in a healthcare end or, uh, side of the equation. Um, I think in terms of um, life sciences, I, I feel the next trend or not next trend, it's already happening now, is how do you sort of use AI to accelerate research faster? I think uh, Shamir mentioned target discovery to clinical development to, to market, right? But we're talking about R&D, so target discovery to clinical development submissions, right? Identify, um, how do you identify unique patients for trials, right? Especially in the rare diseases, oncology spaces. What analytics and data do you need holistically to, to drive this as an outcome. And then the um, other bit around the end part is uh, personalized communication. So many a times we um, put a drug, post-marketing trials capture the information, but there is rarely a continuous um, touch point with the patient. How are you doing? What are the side effects? What is going on with your life? Are you taking the medica medication? And so on. These things of building the trust are all um, I feel are going to be what we are going to see in life sciences. Um, I agree. Uh, Shamir, uh, where do you think um, R&D would, what advice would you give it um, to uh, leaders in a, um, of AI and R&D? Yeah, so, you know, in, 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 a, in a way, we definitely need to lean more on, on the quality side of your your uh, AI efforts. You know, what, what I meant by that is that we can take the same uh, COVID example. So there are around 232 predictive models came around uh, COVID during that peak period of time. And then there was this BM, nice BMJ paper where they looked at these models and, you know, only 5% of them, you know, 11 of them were actually validated models. 
So, you know, in a way, everybody was trying to contribute to the cause of, you know, you know whether I had a friend who's a physicist and, and, and he was actually, he put a model too. So what happened was that people were making a lot of assumptions when they were actually doing the model without that, you know, sort of a domain expertise in, in either in, the, you know, of course, COVID was a new disease, even, even the clinical leaders were also scrambling to understand the disease. So, so a lot of these assumptions we made about the model, the way they were, we were integrating the data, the way we were building the model, and then the inference part were all, in a way, not useful. So just, you know, having an investment in our, in our in AI or data science wouldn't transfer into value. So you have to think about the quality and the value aspects first. So that, that would be my uh, primary advice. And then, then also, it's not a magic bullet, right? Like we, you know, we talked about, you know, whether the, these, these models have challenges, right? Like they are, they are built using, this is very much purpose built, you know, and I, I can tell you another example, especially on the purpose built part. So we were uh, looking into, uh, since Shubha mentioned about the heart failure part, so we were looking into, you know, patients who could be readmitted after a heart failure uh, related uh, admission in a hospital. So we were building a model for, for one of the hospital in the New York City. We wanted to replicate that with another hospital. It's, a, it's not part of our, our health system, it's a different health system. We couldn't get it replicated with the same performance. It's in the same state, we all follow almost the same clinical protocol. Why we are not able to do that? Because they have a different, you know, PBM, right? Like the, their pharmacy benefit manager and some of their frontline drugs are slightly different. That will have impact because your top features that you predicted here were you know, some use of some drugs and then use of some medications. When, but when you go to the other hospital, they don't use that for that right use case. So they, they use them, but in a, in a different way. So these type of variabilities. So the challenge is that understanding that reality, right? The data doesn't capture everything. The system is fairly complex, much more complex than an automated car. So I, you know, I do not expect we will have an end-to-end -end drug development system coming out in, you know, in another, five, you know, 10 or 20 years. No, but then, like Bill mentioned or Super mentioned, we have a lot of accelerated activity within the pocket. So we can see a lot of nudges or, you know, acceleration due to AI. But that end air process, because we don't, we don't understand, we still don't know the biology of type 2 diabetes. Even if you know Huntington disease for I don't know 50 years, we still don't have a therapy for. It. There is, a, there is a whole lot of other, other challenges in the field, so we have to be mindful of that and then make that investment that will lead to value, in my opinion. Don't expect it as a magic bullet, but just another tool, just like you have other types of tools that you use. AI is one of your tools. This is not the only tool you've got. So that would be my, my take on it. Thank, thank you, everyone, uh, for a really great discussion. So I will jump into questions because we don't have much time, and I think this question is actually very interesting. Uh, what percentage of AI development work in your firm goes into production, and what are you doing tactically to better optimize the work of your data scientist? Uh, and uh, so it's it's an interesting question. Um, anyone wants to take that? I can take that. I I, I mentioned earlier that um, one can argue. That data science has not been uh, there in pharma and life sciences now. It's always been there. The statisticians are your data scientists pretty much because that's what they have been doing for all this time. What has changed? And so the question is, how much does that go into production? Pretty much 100%, because otherwise you wouldn't see the trials. The challenge is that is that enough, right? Because if you see that one in 4,000 drugs reach to the market capability. And so what do we need to do to change that scenario um, is, the, is, is the better question asked. So if you argue um, that um, how many data scientists, uh, how many data science projects in, a, in life sciences space, your statisticians are the data scientists. Yeah, like Shamir said, there are additional mathematical models that are getting done, causality, correlation, how do you get through all this forecasting, whatnot. But at the end of the day, it's a computing power that's, that's making it happen. Um, but I think more, more the, this, the discussion needs to be much more of how can you sort of, um, I go back to my statement, look at R&D as an algorithm. What, what else do you need to do there to make that um, change faster? 
Yeah, just just want to, uh, want to add a point there. Like you know, in, in my experience, uh, overall, maybe within the industry, it's about sixty to eighty percentage are being you know uh, applied. In, I mean, like or in a way productionized. But then the productionization, uh, it it kind of depends a lot. You know, like you know, are you using it internally, or you know, it's, is it you know you're going to deploy it on a trial, deploy it on a you know for for actual patient use. These are all different different levels or different type of tired questions. And then I don't see that every model that we bring will end up in a trial. That's not happening, right? Like, you know, some of the models like, like we talked about today could have serious issues. They, you know, we may start with the good intent and then realize that the model is not either, it's not scaling up, not, not predicting well, but it's not applied, applicable in a global patient setting where our, a lot of our trials are like that because we don't have, you know, we don't, have, we don't get that key predictor, let's say in different geographical regions. So the model is not usable. So I would put it around 60 to 80 percentage, but then uh, it really depends on the application area. That 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 range changes a lot. So thank you, thank you, Bill, Shamir, and Shubhajikam, and really share all these, uh, you know, experienced and uh, lived and been there insights and how you where you think um, the future of AI in healthcare is going. Um, thank you. Um, and bye, everyone. Thank you.